We've got an opportunity to finish this job off that we started way back in 1955. We've got an opportunity, I think, that like's never been before. I tell you, even last year, I mean, the farmer thought, I mean, he was in trouble. I don't care whether they're big or small or what their size is, every farmer is looking for some help. They're looking for some help. It's going to be your and my job this winter to make sure they see where the right help is. I can remember back, uh, it wasn't too many years ago, I started in the early 60s, but you could pull into a farmer's yard and about three out of every five, they'd ask you to leave. Well, I'll guarantee you that's not true today. Today you drive in the average farmer's yard and once he finds out you're from National Farmers Organization, he won't hardly let you go. It's going to be our job this winter to educate him on our programs. That bargaining is more than marketing. To help you with that job, we've got some advertising materials. That's partly my job. The promotional materials, I've got a booth over here. I think one of the best items that you can use for advertising is the NFO cap. The people that I buy that cap makes six, I should say the people that I buy that cap from make 60,000 caps a day, five days a week. And there are many others that are in the business. So you see, there's a few people around that think that it pays to advertise with a cap. It comes eyeball to eyeball with the people that we still need in National Farmers Organization. It comes eyeball to eyeball, and it pays to advertise. Everybody likes to do business with somebody that's doing business. Just an example. I got a call here a few days ago at the home office from, from a fellow that wasn't a member. He wasn't even a farmer. But he knew that we had a bumper sticker that says, milk drinkers make better lovers. <laughs> he seen National Farmers Organization on the bottom of it. He says, can I buy one of those from you? I said, I sure can. I can fix you right up. He said, I've got just one other question. He says, do you have one that says I'm a milk drinker? <laughs> well, I've been thinking about it. So it pays to advertise. They read bumper stickers. They read the emblem on that cap. They read the gate signs that you hang out in front of a member's, member's place. So stop by and, and chat at the booth. We can help you out. Another thing, if you're close enough to the home office, and Ohio's close enough, so that'll give you some kind of an idea, if you can arrange a bus trip, load up a busload of, of the farmers in your area, some businessmen, maybe bring along some newspaper, a radio personality or two. We'll show them through the office. We'll let them visit with the department heads. We'll answer their questions. And I'll guarantee you that they'll go home convinced. We've got the system. All we need is the production to make it work. Another good way is sometime this winter, and earlier the better, put yourself together one of those, what Butch Swain used to call, famous whole hog sausage feeds. There's nothing any better. That's where Jack, uh, I think, uh, uh, you bet, that's where Jack got started. But I tell you what, the demand on everybody's time is so great, it don't make any difference whether it's for a church meeting, an NFO meeting, or you name it. You've got to feed them to get them out. You've got to feed them to get them out. Call me at the home office. We'll help you set up. We'll tell you how to set up a meeting. We'll furnish you a speaker and tell the story. Remember, they're hungry for information. It isn't hard to sell a ticket to get them to come anymore. They're looking for help. We'll help you. Just give me a call at the home office. Stop by and see me at the booth over at the auditorium. Okay, enough for that commercial. Uh, yes? 
I've been thinking about it. Okay, the, the last speaker for this evening is a gentleman that I just met for the first time this evening, but we started looking uh, early for a banker uh, that could uh, speak at this meeting. We wanted to finish the meeting off with a banker, and this fellow comes to us very highly recommended, and he's from Coldwater, Kansas, and I've got to tell you a little story about a banker. I hope this don't uh, hurt your feelings, but the story goes something like this. The fellow went into his local banker to borrow a little money, and and uh, he sat down across from the banker, and and uh, this banker had been blind uh, uh, for, for quite some time, and quite some time ago, he would got himself a glass eye. And he was very, very proud of that glass eye because he'd went to the best people in the business to get that glass eye. It was one that, boy, looked so natural. It moved with the other eye. It even, uh, uh, it looked just, just perfect. You couldn't tell which was the real eye and which was the bad eye. So this banker got in the habit that when the fellow sat down, he says, he'd look at him, he says, now, John, I know you're in here to borrow a little money. But he says, I'll tell you, I'll give you that money under one condition. If you'll look me straight in the eye and tell me which one of those eyes is the glass eye, he says, I'll be more than happy to make that loan. The guy looked at him looked at him for a little while and he come back and he says, well, Mr. Banker, he says, that's very simple. He says, it's your left eye. He says, you're right. He says, but how could you tell? You're the first one that ever guessed. Well, he says, Mr. Banker, he says, that was very simple for me, very easy, because it was your only eye that had a little compassion in it. I'll guarantee you that this banker does have some compassion in his heart, but he also has to face reality. He knows that things aren't good down on the farm. And again, if you'll pardon me, uh, I'm going to read you a little bit about his background. His name is James Harrington. He's chairman and president of the Coldwater National Bank in Coldwater, Kansas. He's a 32-year veteran of banking, educated at the University of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He joined the Coldwater National Bank in 1951. He is a United States uh, Air Force veteran. He's active in civic projects uh, in his community. He served on the local hospital, or he, s he serves on the local hospital board, is past president of the school board and city council is a past direct district governor of the Lions International. In 1970, he became chairman and president of the Wilmore State Bank of Wilmore, Kansas. He has been active in the Kansas Bankers Association, serving as regional vice president, chairman of the nominating committee and the structural task force. In the Independent Bankers Association, he has been chairman of the Agricultural Rural America Committee and a member of the Bank Education, Resolutions, and Federal Legislation Committees. He was first elected vice president, uh, or he was elected first vice president of the IBAA last March in Honolulu, Hawaii at the IBAA 57 or 52nd annual convention. Golly, if you, get, if you get to be a banker, you can go to Honolulu. I just found that out. So anyway. All joking aside, it gives me a great pleasure to ask up here to the podium, James Harrington. Thank you very much, Lee. President Woodland, I certainly enjoyed the dinner with him tonight. We had a real good visit, and uh, I think you're just a super group. While I was sitting over here listening to these other two speakers, I just can hardly figure out how to follow two acts like that. Jack and John certainly did a good job. It reminded me of Zsa Zsa Gabor. I heard her name on the news tonight. Her eighth husband said, I just don't know how I'm going to make this interesting and different. <laughs> and that's just the way I feel. <laughs> but Zsa Zsa got the 
in England, she gave a $23,000 pair of uh, diamond earrings to some charity. I just heard it on the news this evening. And uh, some Britisher had, it, had these earrings appraised, and they found out they were less than worth less than $700. I don't know who the sharpie was that gave her those $23,000 earrings. <laughs> Bankers, sometimes uh, a few years ago, you heard this proper song, You Picked a Good Time to Leave Me, Lucille. <laughs> we weren't concerned about the 400 children, but that crop in the field sure did shake us up. <laughs> That's a tribute to the farm women. We, we know that you help get the crops in. <laughs> My wife and I uh, have enjoyed going around over the country the last year and a half. Independent Bankers Association of America, representing the bankers in the small, small communities. We've uh, made, the, well, last year from March to March, I was out of the bank about uh, 65 or 70 days. I'm supposed to be a working banker. And uh, believe me, we don't have a big uh, personnel in our bank to handle a lot of things, but I've got a good crew there that takes care of things when I'm gone. But I think that everybody should contribute something to their profession. My contribution to independent banking and banking in the small town communities is to contribute something to myself to give back to the next generation. And that's just what you people are doing. And I'll certainly take my hats off to the NFO and the, and the uh, progress you've made since 1955. You know, remember uh, Ezra Taft Benson, that's the guy's name, yeah, back in the 50s. I'll give you a little bit before I go into my prepared speech, but this is on my mind quite a little bit. When the uh, Marshall Plan began in 1950, in the 50s, <clears throat> the United States before that had never used food as a strategic weapon over the world. The farmers could go to the marketplace and they, historically the farmer farmed a little bit for his own family to supply himself with food. And after that he sold it to local communities, give him some cash. And then he sold it to the state and the national level. But th things have changed quite a bit since then, as you well know. Since the Marshall Plan, the United States government had decided to use food as a weapon, apparently. And you know what I know, that every time they put some kind of a, uh, embargo on anything, cattle, wheat, soybeans, feed grains, trying to starve out some of our people over the world, it just doesn't work out that way because every time it happens we lose our markets. <clears throat> I personally believe that if the United States is going to use farm commodities as a weapon, they should pay the farmers for that weapon, whether they grow it or not. And I think that if they quit meddling, we would quit losing our primary suppliers over the seas when we can export products like we have been lately. The nations over the world are looking at the American farmer, the American government is not a very reliable source. And we'll be the, we'll be the residual supplier, not the primary supplier of world products like the food and, and grain we're selling. It's like somebody comes to the bank. I, you, countries are just like individuals, except they're collective type things. <clears throat> Would you want to do business with your banker if you went in one day and, and said, I need to borrow $1,000 to pay a fuel bill? I had a small fuel barrel filled up the other day. It cost 1000 bucks. <clears throat> and he told you, I don't even know you today. But the next time you go in, he says, sure, I'll loan you anything you want. Next time you go back, he doesn't know you again. You know, hot, run hot and cold all the time with you. And you'd, about the second time, you'd probably find you another banker. I think that you've got to be dependable. It's the same as the United States government needs to be a dependable source of food supplies, whether it's for Russia, Argentina, Mexico, France, Spain, or anybody. We've got to be a dependable supplier of food goods if we're going to be in the market. And that's uh, a thing that I think we should all be concerned about. We need to tell our public uh, uh, non-farming friends about it. But anyway, it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you at your annual meeting of the National Farmers Association organization, excuse me, and it's natural for us to be friends because the National Farmers Organization and the Independent Bankers Association of America have many similar goals and concerns. You represent tens of thousands of independent farmers and ranchers who can compete with conglomerates, big corporations, absentee owners of farmland, and other farm assets many of whom lack the farm, family farmer's dedication to conserving the soil 
and working for the betterment of the local community. The Independent Banking Association of America represents 7,200 community banks, and we operate in a world of Citicorp, Merrill Lynch, and other money, market, money center firms, the likes of whom want to constantly work to divert the funds from the local communities to big deals elsewhere, like for, loans to foreign countries and other big projects that are far removed from the local communities. I believe that our similarity of purpose is based upon the fact that both your, our members, both of family farms and the independent bankers, are struggling to serve their communities and, as local citizens and businessmen in an era of business mergers and economic concentration in the financially, financial industry and depressed farm prices in most of the economy. IBA member banks are partners with you in the agricultural economy. We've got to be. The greatest dollar volume of operating loans for agriculture is made by banks with less assets than $25 million. And over 80% of our membership are banks with less than $25 million, million dollar assets. And we have a large membership in 18 of the agricultural states of this country, as the NFO has membership in these states also. As your partners in the agricultural economy, we're totally aware that many farmers and ranchers are facing an increasingly severe cash income squeeze. Net cash income in 1982 is expected to be lo even lower than the one in 1981, despite the fact that you're harvesting record crops of wheat and corn and all kinds of commodities. We share with you the painful reality that selling your credit lines during the coming winter may be the most difficult task facing most of you this year. The situation is made more severe by the fact that farmland and other farm asset prices are soft and that many farmers have already substituted debt for inadequate cash income to the extent that their cash flows are almost already unmanageable. The IBAA is directly supporting measures to turn the farm economy around in the right direction. We have urged the Congress and the administration to make maximum effort to expand export markets of farm commodities and to give the American farmer free and unhindered access to world markets. We need to get some uh, subsidies going for the exports because the European common market, as the John said a while ago, they're paying their farmers subsidies to export this food cheaper than we can raise it, and that's not very good for our farmers. This country should do everything possible to expand the export of farm products at prices which return the maximum dollar to U.S. producers. But efforts to expand the exports are not enough, and I believe that our government has not been acting promptly enough to cut production, reduce surplus stocks, and position the agricultural economy for a turnaround. For instance, while our production plants in non-farm economy have cut back to an average of 69% of their capacity to reduce these in inventories and position these uh, industries for the recovery, the agricultural economy in 1982 increased production of wheat and feed grains by 1% over the record crops of 1981. While I recognize that production cycles in agriculture are difficult and they're much more different from the industries that are not subject to weather conditions and other hazards. It does not make sense to produce ourselves into the chronic surplus situation that characterized much of the 1950s and 1960s. To head off such a development, the IBAA joined with much of the agricultural community earlier this year and supported the legislation for a larger land set-aside program in 1983, including paid acreage diversions. As you know, Congress passed legislation requiring a set-aside and paid diversion program for wheat and feed grains, which the administration is now administering. Although it's too early to know how successful this plan will be, it's a step in the right direction, we believe. In, su in support of the set-aside program and paid diversion program, we know that the NFO has recognized for many years the need to complement the government's effort by serving as a bargaining and marketing agent for farmers and livestock producers. 
You can be proud of your organization's achievements in adding muscle to the agriculture producers in the marketplace. We applaud your efforts and success in this area. We look upon the government land diversion programs as a complement to your activities, which together can hopefully en enable the farm economy to become more prof profitable. While on the subject of government action, I assure you that the IBAA will work with the agricultural community to maintain and strengthen price support loans, deficiency payments, and other agreements during the very critical period for the agricultural economy. We need broader public recognition that agricultural producers cannot survive in the future on the basis of appreciating assets and low realized cash income, especially since it, assets far, from the farms are no longer appreciating. We must have a higher annual cash return to farmers and ranchers in this country. Many of you, no doubt, are preoccupied with the weeks ahead when you meet your local lenders to arrange financing for next year's production. Of course, and I cannot speak for, for your bankers and your community, but I know that these bankers and your community will continue to be a big help to you in serving your capital needs. They've got to stay with you on this program to, to come out themselves. As the, as the farmer goes, as the man said earlier today, John, so goes the American economy, so goes the local banker, so goes the local businessman. And I have never seen or read in the history where this country had a depression when the farm was pr for farmers were prosperous. It just doesn't work that way. Before this uh, crisis we've got now in the farm economy, the uh, exports we raised and shipped overseas helped pay the oil production that we shipped in here from overseas. You know, we spent, uh, I think we had a surplus of over $40 million, $40 billion in export and import, and most of that was caused by the farm economy, the exports of farm goods. But when the farmers prosper, the rest of the country prospers, and the farmers are the largest single users of petroleum products. That takes care of the airlines and anybody else you want to mention. The farm industry uses more petroleum products than any other industry in our country. We want to help the local businessmen to recognize that there are powerful forces also at work in our economy and our government which are making it more difficult for each of us to survive and serve our mutual needs. One of these uh, forces at work involves a federal credit system. The federal land bank presidents met here in Louisville, I think, probably in the September or October? Early September. Early September. They're concerned about what our Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Ben, Mr. Uh, Regan, has to do. Regan is the one that's initiating the program. Several months ago, I'll tell you about that, Treasury Secretary Donald Regan initiated a scheme designed to remove the federal agency status from federal farm credit bonds and in other, in other ways to make it more difficult for the farm credit system to secure funds to finance farmers and ranchers. If you imagine what this would do to the farmers who are trying to make some land payments, uh, Secretary of the Treasury Donald Reagan calls it privatize. He wants to privatize the farm credit system so that the Federal Land Bank, FHA, PCAs, won't be making any loans to you eventually. And as somebody said here earlier, all these bad ideas keep coming back year after year after year. And they've had that in their mind for a long time. And I hope they'll never get it done, but they're working on it. The point there is that Merle Lynch, some of the big, 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 big city banks, city core, will be the ones that you could go to for a farm loan. If you want to buy some land, you go to the, to the bank or an insurance company which has a lot of loans anyway, but they won't make any 25, 20, 25, 30-year loans. And, and when this happens, the interest rates will be much higher, and you know what will happen to farm land prices, they'll go down. So that's what we're worried about right now. This is, uh, the farm credit system is, uh, to get this out of this, uh, federal status. So there are indications 
that the administration will at attempt to move ahead with these steps sometime after last month's congressional elections. These potential moves against the farm credit system would be consistent with Secretary Reagan's view that specialized lending institutions are somehow bad and inferior to financial supermarkets, such as Merrill Lynch, which he previously headed before he went to the Treasury Department. However, such, mo such moves against the farm credit do not make any sense at this time or any time, especially given the present fragile financial condition of the farmers and ranchers. I mentioned Treasury Secretary Reagan's advocacy of financial supermarkets. His basic view, which he outlined in September last year in a speech at the Civic Federation of Chicago, is that government should open the way for the nation's largest security brokerage firms, insurance companies, bank holding companies, and other nationwide chains such as Sears to evolve in the, into a few money center financial conglomerates or supermarkets, which would dominate the nation's money and financial markets. Secretary Reagan's strategy is to bowl over those who would resist by installing that financial, con by insisting that financial concentration is inevitable. So why resist a bit of tidying up of legal odds and ends that are inconveniences to the financial conglomerates? Thus, Reagan Lieutenant R.T. McNamara of the Treasury Department said in another Chicago speech six weeks ago that, quote, what we seek to do is provide a legal framework for the consolidation of financial service entities that seem ine inevitable, end quote. Specifically, Secretary Reagan's Treasury Department has on its legislative agenda for 1983 a bill which would open the way legally for the major bank holding companies headquartered in money centers such as New York, Chicago, and San Francisco to sell stocks and bonds, insurance, and other financial products along with their commercial banking activities. Citicorp, Bank America, Corporation, and others would become the money center financial supermarkets for the nation. This greatly concerns the IBAA because there does not seem to be a place in Secretary Reagan's scheme of things for local banks who can make independent decisions on lending to farmers and ranchers, small businesses, and others in the communities where they're located. Secretary Reagan's version of financial supermarkets should concern you greatly also. How many of you believe that the loan officers in City Corps, Continental Bank of Illinois, will see the hundreds of thousands of commercial family farmer operators and farm operators in this country, whose annual sales are, say, less than $200,000, as prime customers when they wish to serve, who they wish to serve in the long run. They won't know you, I'm sure of that. I had a deal where uh, small banks, we, uh, my bank's about, uh, about $11 million of total assets, and we can make you know, 150, around $200,000 loans, but then some of our operations are bigger than that. So about two years ago when the prime interest rates got up to 22%, New York Prime was there, we were making loans about 15% at our bank because the money market certificates were costing us almost that. We had to keep it down a little bit because we are going to kill our farmers and ranchers. They couldn't stand that high price interest. <clears throat> I called on our correspondent in Wichita, a big bank up there that our bank had been doing business with since 1896. I told them I need to sell about a $100,000 loan to them, local farmer. I said, what are you charging me for this? I'd already made up the loan 15%. He said, we're going to get 19% from you. Well, oh, that's, that's great. <clears throat> How come? He said, well, imagine this. And it all comes, comes true because this is what's happened since then. He said, all right, I'll take your loan, $100,000 overline, to the loan committee in the morning. And here's another loan officer. Comes in with a loan of $20 million to assess our Boeing aircraft for 19%. Who do you think they're going to want to do business with, you or the Boeing or Cessna? I said, but you're killing the farmers. I said, we don't care. We don't care. And I was out in Phoenix in, uh, let's see, the first, about the first of November of this year. And a story on the headlines of this, this paper, Phoenix, uh, Arizona's got uh, about four or five big banks that control everything in the state, Valley National and, and uh, Arizona Bank and a couple more Western Bank. And they had a story in the headlines of this paper, and I thought, Gosh, that is something, you know. They said this bank was going to help production. That's just, just about a month ago. 
going to help production, going to help people buy more cars, going to help buy more washing machines. They're going to cut the consumer loans from 18% down to 17 and installment loans on autos and things from 22% down to 21. Hell, we didn't have any loans in our bank that much even <laughs> two years ago. So they're doing you a big favor. So that's what your conglomeration is going to come to if Secretary Reagan has his way with this, uh, uh, putting all these things together. They keep saying big is the best. I noticed today that Bunker, Bunker, was it Bunker Hunt sold out this weekend. Sold out all his farm equipment down in Dallas. And he said that there wasn't any money in farming. So he got so big, I think he laid off 200 and something employees. So he's a pretty big farmer, and he couldn't make it. So uh, it gives you an idea how, how good big is. But Secretary Reagan's version of the financial supermarket should concern us all very greatly. How many, how many times the observations that uh, do you think that they want to do business with you when they could uh, do business with a big uh, conglomerate, conglomerate uh, manufacturer? See, right now they're thinking about maybe in years to come they might do business with a few thousand farmers instead of a few hundred thousand or a million farmers. That's what they have in mind. So if they could do business with a few thousand farmers instead of a, a couple of million, that'd be a lot cleaner deal for them. And they'd make one loan to one big farmer instead of maybe a thousand loans to a thousand farmers. So it makes, makes sense that if you want to get big, that's what they're striving for. And remember, as indicated earlier, Secretary Reagan's master plan looks critically upon the farm credit system as a specialized agricultural lender and would poke holes in the agricultural safety net if allowed to proceed. Our big, our, one of our competitors is a, production credit, which uh, the guy that runs it up north of us is a real good friend of mine. Uh, we talk about the farmer's needs and everything, but we, we, we make plenty of money at, at the little bank. I mean, you know, the bank is supposed to make a lot of money. Right now, we're not making any money, but I say we've got enough to live comfortably on. And like uh, Walter Reston, the city corps, some of these people that run these big banks in the cities, I know how they live. They live pretty well. And uh, they've got chauffeur-driven limousines, probably, and they've got all kinds of good things. They make lots of money for their salaries and everything. But why would they want to get any bigger than they are? You know, you know, you got food, clothing, and shelter. You live a pretty good life. You got kids in school. You can get credit at the grocery store, and the barber tells you jokes. You know, and things like that. It's a pretty good life. <laughs> but I don't know what these people really want. You know, if if a guy owns a city core. No one man owns it anyway, but he's just a hired gun for him. And what gets me down is if, if he's uh, so helpful that when he retires, they'll give him an engraved watch and uh, hope the door doesn't hit him as he leaves, and they'll hire somebody else to take his place. But what I think that really this big machine running is that if they can control your access to credit, I think they'd make slaves out of you. <laughs> If you came to Coldwater, Kansas, said, Jim, I'd like to have a loan and buy some cattle. The way they do us at Coldwater National Bank, they go out to the sale company and buy some cattle. Come and say, hey, Jim, I wrote a check for $50,000. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's great. We'll take care of it. But if you did that with a great, great big uh, holding company type thing like Merrill Lynch and uh, City Corps, some of those people like that, if you went to the Coldwater National Bank, Got the same ownership would own that one. It would own it in Wichita. It would own it in Pratt, Kansas. It would own it in Hudson. Maybe own it in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Where would you go? You kind of think about that a little bit because if you can control your access to credit, you, you, you've got, got everybody in this country right where you, you might want them if you want slavery. But there's no place for you to go, and I think that things that should concern the American people more than anything else right now, freedom has slipped away from people easier than this is, without a war, without reading your mail, without tapping your phone lines, say we're going to get control of this financial system and control their access to credit, and brother, we've got you where you can't move. No way. Just your access to credit. So keep that in mind when they say, keep saying, let's consolidate this and that. It's not any good for anybody, and it scares me to death. I believe that Secretary Reagan's plan for the American future is possible, but that is neither desirable 
nor inevitable as they keep saying it is. Indeed, I don't believe it really can happen politically unless those of us who believe in the diverse nation of independent farmers, community bankers, and small businessmen and other local enterprises allow ourselves to be isolated into separate camps. And I know the farmers, he's had that since the world began. While others control the agenda and timing of the political action. But that is a distant danger. That is a distinct danger that they'll separate you people from each other, the small banks and the small businessmen, the implement dealers from each other, and uh, to get pres the uh, Secretary of the Treasury Regan's plan and work because they're really striving to get it done. Earlier I discussed the, the, uh, some of the areas of dis direct interest in agriculture producers where the IBAA has made it our business to get deeply involved during the past year. We're sure that we're going to re remain involved. And this past year, we've doubled our agriculture committee of bank bankers. And uh, we hope to get some more input from a lot of our banker friends all over the country. I've been to Washington a few times to testify before the House Agricultural Committee as a banker. <clears throat> and would you believe that five agriculture department people are there, and then there's about three of us farmer bankers there, and some, a good wheat farmer from Texas, I forget his name, really a good guy. And the, these people sit at this committee hearing, and like you're there, they look down at you like, you know, you're just like nothing. You're just like nothing. And uh, the, uh, what gets me down is the, the uh, agriculture department people act like they didn't know anything. They said, well, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. I said, my God, it worked in the 50s because I was in the bank and we did that. It helped the farmers out. And David Stockman says, well, it, it'll impact the budget so much. It won't impact the budget so much if they get the farm prices up there where they can pay these uh, loans off, commodity credit loans off, they did in the 50s. <clears throat> and then when they'd ask a direct question to the farm, to this uh, agriculture department, they'd say, well, I'll let Jack take that question. And he said, I believe I'll pass it on. And they didn't know anything. But believe me, I don't think the farmer has very many friends in the agriculture department. They got down to the nitty gritty about how does this commodity credit uh, loan work? We don't understand that. I said, y'all, it's just a little agreement like that. And it says you've got X number of bushels in a bonded warehouse, give them the loan for it. And they said, well, then the government's got to pay all it off. Less than 2% of those loans were ever taken over by the government in the 50s. The farm prices got up there and the farmers could rede redeem them and make money on top of what the loan price was. And I tried to tell them that, but it's, you know how that goes. But it, you come out of there feeling real exasperated. But believe me, the Independent Bankers Association of America wants the price of these things up there because if you, do, if you go down the tube, believe me, my bank goes down the tube, my home goes down the tube, all the businesses in town go down the tube. If the farmer doesn't make it, nobody makes it. <laughs> but the independent bankers all over the country would welcome you're getting involved in the financial legislation 1983. And I hope I've convinced you that you are vitally affected by the financing, by the financial uh, consolidation measures that are coming into the agenda, and that you ought to make it your business also if possible. By working together on a broad front, we may yet see American future unfold in which family farmers, independent bankers, small businessmen, and other locally controlled enterprises will make up a growing part of America's future. If so, I believe that we and the nation and everyone in this country will be well served. You're an awfully nice group, and I thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, it seems like uh, some of these rural bankers have about as many problems as we as farmers. It looks like we've got a real friend in the Independent Bankers uh, Association of America, and we're glad that you could be with us here this evening. Is there any uh, uh, questions for Jim? Yes.
Well, that, that's a pretty tough question because uh, when this bank that gobbled up the other bank that gobbled up the other bank gets through, they might decide that farming is not very profitable and you never pay the loan off, they figure. There's a bank in Denver, Colorado that over the past 25, 30 years since I've been the Coeur National Bank has called in all of its farm loans three times. They go for energy loans, they go for manufacturing loans, say we don't, we don't, we're not going to loan farmers any, any money, ranchers and all. So these customers they've got went scrambling out to other banks and then they say, well, there's money in farming and ranching. Let's go back and make some farm ranch loans. So they hire a couple of guys, give them a car, and put their bank name on the side of it and take off to get some more loans in. Same thing happened again. Three times they did that. But those of you that don't have that in your local community, if you've got a locally owned bank that the guy sits there and says yes or no, you can have the money, I'd ask you to talk to your representatives, your congressmen in the state, and the federal level also, and try to get them to talk to the legislatures and tell them that we don't want any of this uh, consolidation. Uh, Kansas is going to go through this in January, and I kind of look uh, dread to see it coming, but uh, we've got the forces in Kansas that are coming in, and we're trying to, they're trying to buy the banks, and the people who don't even live in Kansas coming in to buy these banks. It's, we've got a unit banking state. Uh, two, one person can, can own and operate two banks, but he can't be the chairman or president of more than two banks. They call it a unit banking state. But that's a tough problem you've got, and, and I don't know what your answer is, except politically you need to be after that uh, move if you don't have that already. But I, I feel sorry for you, but uh, there's nothing that you can do about it once it happens. That's my uh, whole point of this thing is that the American people, the consumer, doesn't know what's happening to him. I was in Washington to the, uh, I'll take another drink of water. A lot of people think I'm air-cooled, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Washington a couple of months ago. The Federal Reserve Board of Directors had us in for a colloquium, they called it, and, uh, and it was uh, just terrible. They invited uh, about 50 businessmen, bankers from all over the country. They wanted to ask us what we thought about the economy and what we thought about banking. And then they had about 60 of their own people, attorneys and economists, there that uh, every time you'd mention something, they'd slap you down with some, you know, 